Hey GearSeekers, I'm Nick. It's time to talk about AMD's newest CPUs and all the performance, but make sure you watch the entire video to understand the context of what I'm trying to say in this video and not just look at the video title. Now, we've decided that we only wanted to cover the 7600X in this video because I feel as though the 7600X is probably the most interesting CPU in this new lineup from AMD as it stands. Now, we decided to focus on gaming performance only for this video with a few different GPUs. And the reason why we do this is because I think people are gonna be more interested to see how many frames this new CPU can push out with the GPU rather than how fast a fast CPU and GPU rendering at 720p on the lower settings will render anything because that's just not realistic. And we wanted to show the performance in benchmarks that you can actually run yourself. At the time of filming this, we've got no idea about the availability and it's pre-launch, but I think the 7600 is going to be a popular chip for the mid-range gaming market. Now, the main thing I was interested in seeing here was I wanted to see what would happen if we paired the 7600X with two powerful GPU options, the 6900 XT and the 3090 Ti, but unfortunately, I don't have a 6950 XT. I also wanted to see if there's any performance left on the table with the high-end stuff, as I mentioned, as well as some more affordable GPUs. So we also tested with the 3060 Ti and the 6600 XT. But let's start off by getting the biggest thing out of the way with the 7600X, the price. The AMD Ryzen 5 7600X comes in at around $299 or around 499 Australian dollars at the time of filming this video. But as usual, depending on when you're gonna watch this video, it is subject to change. Now, as far as our testing configuration, we built up three benches to test Intel's 12600K, as well as the Ryzen 5 5600X and the Ryzen 5 7600X. But let me just say, there were lots of different BIOS versions going around for these new X670E boards, but our cutoff date was around the 16th of September. We did all of our testing quite early in this review cycle, and I can tell you for a fact that some things have changed, but not enough to you know make a big deal so that's why we're sharing the results from that early testing but i've also got to point out that amd also provided us with the rog crosshair x670e and some g skill triton z neo memory for testing the reason why i'm mentioning this is it's kind of a requirement from amd for us to be able to release this pre-launch content so yeah, we had to use their gear. We also enabled AMD Expo, which is kind of like XMP, which we'll talk about in another video. As I mentioned, there were lots of different BIOS versions and there's quite a few BIOS ticks we had to make to make sure the Ryzen 7000 CPUs were running correctly. Because the BIOS versions were so early, the CPUs in the default mode would run in eco mode. So if you're looking at like the 7900X, it runs at 105 watts, or the 7600X, the CPU that we're featuring in this video, would actually run at 65 watts by default. So we had to manually adjust PBO to turn that up to 105 watts, so it pulls it out of eco mode. As for all the CPUs we tested here, we didn't overclock these chips at all because we wanted to see what those out of the box figures would be like. And I decided not to include the 7900X in this video because we made a separate video with a full 7900X system, which is the one right behind us. And that actually includes the same benchmarks, but it's actually compared to the 12900K, not the 12600K like you're seeing in this video. With that said, Let's start off with what everybody wants to know, Cinebench performance. Now we tested Cinebench R23 only. We've got some historical data with R23 that we've collected over the last year or so, whatever. And we've got all of these chips on hand. If we don't, like I mentioned, we've tested them in the past. And if we don't have results for your chip, it means we've just never had one. So let's see what happened. From our multi-threaded testing in Cinebench R23, it's immediately clear that the 7600X is an interesting animal. In multi-threaded workloads, it falls short of the 12600K by a fair margin, but that's mainly to do with the 12600K technically being a 10-core CPU, not a 6-core like the 7600X. However, 
With single-threaded performance, this is where the 7600X really comes into its own. It completely blows the doors off all of the other CPUs shown in the multi-core graph. We actually use the same CPU, so you can see where they moved around. Although it's only a couple points higher than the 12600K, it absolutely smashes past the 11900K. That's a pretty impressive result. It also goes to show that AMD kind of wants to get that single core speed trading blows with Intel. And it's also got me thinking, how much performance has AMD really left on the table when it comes to the 3D vCache versions of these chips that are coming later? Right, so these things are going to be even faster. Okay, so the 7600X for multi-threaded workloads and single core workloads is decent, but what about what this chip is really designed for? And that's why you're all here, right? And like I mentioned in the intro, the real point of this video is to see how this CPU is for gaming-based benchmarks at real gaming resolutions. Now, we ran five different benchmarks that all use the CPU and the GPU in different ways to see what the performance looks like in different situations. Now, for the configuration, we did enable resizable bar and smart access memory, it just depends on which GPU you're using. And we did that for all of our test benches. We also tested, again, with realistic resolutions that people will actually play games at. With all that said, let's start off with Shadow of the Tomb Raider. This benchmark is built into the game and gives us a good indication of how the game will perform on your system. From the crazy amount of testing that we've done with this benchmark, it's highly influenced by the CPU. The graphs are divided with colors into CPUs and the key is at the bottom to help you better understand the graphs. And you can pause this video at any time to take a look at these graphs for a little bit longer. Let's see what happened in Shadow of the Tomb Raider. With the 3090 Ti, the 7600X leads. However, with the other three GPUs, the 12600K comes out on top at 1080p. At 1440p, we're seeing we become a little bit more GPU bound and start to see most of the performance metrics even out across the board. And at 4K, we hit that hard GPU ceiling and the results across the board start to even out once more. There wasn't even a single frame of difference between any of these benchmarks except for the 6600 XT. Let's move on to superposition. For this superposition test, we perform three tests in total. We do our regular tests here, 4K optimized, a custom 1440p preset, and 1080p extreme. Immediately, we can see the same results are being echoed with superposition at 1080p extreme because this benchmark is GPU bound and we're hitting that hard ceiling, however, at 1440p, we're seeing that the 7600X and the 3090 Ti are the top of the performance. At 4K, we're hitting that hard ceiling with the GPU again, but the 7600X still performs as expected, so nothing too surprising here. Next up is Basemark GPU. Basemark gives us a great indication of Vulkan performance in both Windows and Linux. We will be covering Linux in another video, not this one because we ran out of time. The great thing with Basemark is it is really, really good at exposing weaknesses with both CPUs and GPU combinations. At 1080p with the 7600X and the 12600K, they're so close in performance that it's hard to pick a real winner. The main thing with these results is the FPS numbers are really high. However, because they're high for all of the CPUs, the percentage difference is actually quite small between all the CPUs. And with the 6900 XT and almost all AMD GPUs in Basemark, it shows clear weaknesses with CPUs and with GPUs. At 1440p, we become super GPU bound and it's almost dead even across the board here. And lastly, at 4K, we're seeing more of the same here while we hit that GPU ceiling. Again, I just wanted to mention that we do it this way because these are real resolutions that people will actually play games at. I wanted to change this up by running some benchmarks for a title that has become a lot more popular lately, Cyberpunk 2077. We did this one a little differently though. Because FSR is supported by both Nvidia and AMD GPUs, I wanted to see what the story was if we tested this at high settings with FSR set to balanced mode because for a game like Cyberpunk, you need to use that type of scaling if you want it to work well. But let's start off with 1080p. 
First off the bat, we're seeing that the 7600X and the 6900 XT are leading the whole field. It's also worth mentioning that with the 3090 Ti and the 7600X, it's also on top in that little field as well. What I think is happening here is that since Cyberpunk has been optimized for consoles now, and all the consoles both use AMD GPUs and CPUs, some of that has trickled down into the PC version. Whether or not that's true, I don't know, but I feel like it is something to consider. At 1440p with the 6900 XT and 7600X, they're still out on top, but because we're now more GPU bound, the 3090 Ti actually gained some ground here with the 12600K. And lastly at 4K, we are GPU bound and the 12600K with the 3090 Ti are ahead of the pack by only two frames. For the last set of benchmarks, we use Horizon Zero Dawn. This is a pretty popular one to test since like Basemark, it can expose both strengths and weaknesses with both CPUs and GPUs. At 1080p in Horizon Zero Dawn, the 7600X with both the 3090 Ti and 6900 XT comes out on top. The gap between the 7600X and the 12600K with the 3090 Ti is huge. And even with the other GPUs, the 7600X slightly edges out the 12600K. Moving on to 1440p, we're seeing more of the same with the 3090 Ti and the 6900 XT being so close with the 6900 XT and the 3090 Ti for almost all the CPUs except the 7600X blasting ahead of all of it with the 3090 Ti. I hope that made sense. Lastly at 4K, we hit that hard ceiling and almost everything across the board is equal here. Something else I was interested in was actually integrated GPU performance since all of these new Zen 4 CPUs have integrated our DNA 2 graphics. Now, the thing is, AMD even stated that the performance is not groundbreaking. However, I was curious to see what the story was. Now we ran four benchmarks just to see what the deal was with this. First off, we ran Shadow of the Tomb Raider and the performance is not amazing, but I'd say that at 720p low, it would at least be kind of playable, I guess. With Unige and Superposition, the results are a bit of a mixed bag. It's not amazing and the performance isn't great, but what did you expect from an integrated GPU? Not to mention Superposition isn't actually a game, it's just a benchmark. So, you know, you can use that one for free if you like to test it. Cyberpunk 2077 fared a bit better. Now we did run this with FSR set to ultra performance and the images kind of looked like a mosaic of pixels, but I just had to know. I'd, I'd say that those numbers are decent and playable if you wanted to look at a Van Gogh painting and not Night City, so. You know, do with that as you like. It's not great, but you know, performance is there. And lastly, Horizon Zero Dawn, again, same deal, not amazing. I don't, wouldn't even call this one playable, but you know, it is what it is. And because you guys probably want to know, I did you a favor. Aren't I such a nice guy? We can draw a few conclusions for the AMD Ryzen 5 7600X. For a six core CPU, it's impressive. And you have to remember, we compared it to a similar chip from Intel, which is technically a 10 core chip. The single core performance is a lot better than we've seen from an AMD CPU since the inception of Ryzen. As with any new platform though, I think right now the price of admission is quite high if you're looking at the X670 boards and the X670E boards, but you know, we will be seeing the B650 boards very soon, which should entice people a little bit more into this new platform. But also take into account though, everything that we're seeing here is with DDR5 and a new socket. But if you're coming from AM4, most of the coolers that you're going to see that you've probably already got or you've already used or you're looking to buy will adapt easily without any additional brackets. I have seen reports of Heaps of companies saying that you need to buy upgrade kits, but that's just not the case from the testing that I've done. As usual, when we see these overhauled platforms and really new technology like DDR5 and PCIe 5.0 and all these bells and whistles that come along with new platforms like this AM5 platform, you'll be paying an early adopters tax. Now, the main issue here is I feel that, at least from the time of filming this, that X670 feels a little bit like a beta version. Now, there's been so many BIOS revisions since we received the hardware. I already mentioned this earlier, but a lot of the features that are in the BIOS are there, but you have to go searching for them. Someone who isn't a seasoned PC builder might not know how to extract the performance they paid for 
out of the hardware they just spent their money on. Now I hope AMD along with the board partners can rectify this quickly. It is a little bit disappointing, but at the same time, people have short memories. This happens with almost every new platform that launches. And as I said earlier, it's all part of being an early adopter. Overall, from what I've tested with the 7600X, I'm impressed. However, you have to ask yourself, is AMD doing the right thing with the pricing? This is an expensive entry point, and if I'm being honest, it's not priced quite as competitively as it should be. Is AMD the new Intel? I guess time will tell.